last year, we began our journey in the book of Acts, and we got through 12 chapters. Hopefully this year we'll be able to complete our journey in Acts as we move through chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And we'll be in Acts chapter 13 this morning. So what we saw in the first part of Acts was you had, you had kind of a theme verse in Acts 1.8 where the Spirit comes and, and Jesus actually tells them before he, before he ascends, he says, you will be my witnesses in all of Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Right? Acts 1.8. You are going to be my witnesses. You're going to go out and you're going to show and tell the world the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the story goes. The story goes as the church and the gospel advance. They're empowered by the Spirit at Pentecost in Acts 2. And they're empowered for mission. They're empowered to go out and proclaim the gospel. And people are hearing the gospel. And they're responding to the gospel with faith in Jesus Christ. And by faith, I mean that they are giving their allegiance not to a Jewish ritual or to a practice or to a kind of ethnicity. They're giving their allegiance to Jesus. Faith in Jesus Christ. Not faith in their circumcision or in their heritage or in their history, but faith in Jesus. And then in Acts 8, persecution breaks out and they're spread all throughout the world. And you start to see the gospel advance into Judea and Samaria. It started in Jerusalem. And then it, in Acts 8, it starts moving out. Persecution breaks out. Saul is actually ravaging the church, it says. And persecution breaks out. And so the Christians are moving out by, by kind of force. And in this time, we meet an Ethiopian eunuch who receives the gospel. We see that Saul is converted, the, the persecutor of the church, the one that was trying to imprison and kill all the Christians. He's converted to Christianity. And we see the Gentiles being filled with the Spirit. And this is mind-blowing because originally Christianity was kind of this early Jewish movement. It was like a kind of an offshoot of Judaism in one sense. But God has much bigger intentions than just saving one nation. He's about the ends of the earth. And so he brings the Gentiles in. And they're filled with the Spirit. And Peter's like, whoa, this is huge. This is big. This is going to cover the entire world. And what you have here in chapter 13 is Paul's first missionary journey. Paul's first missionary journey. He's going to travel to Cyprus in the first 12 verses and then go to Antioch and Pisidia in the rest of 13. And then in chapter 14, he's going to go to Iconium and Lystra. And that's the journey of his first missionary journey, chapters 13 and 14 of Acts. And then let me just give you a little clue of where we're going. Acts 28, the very last verse, Paul's in prison in Rome. And guess what he's doing? He's proclaiming about the kingdom of God and teaching about the, the person of Jesus Christ. That's what it says, Acts 28, 30 and 31. Paul's in Rome. Started in Jerusalem. He's gone all throughout the Mediterranean world. And now he's in Rome. He was trying to get to Spain. And he's in prison in Rome. And what's he doing there? He's proclaiming the gospel. He's proclaiming the kingdom of God. He's proclaiming the person of Jesus Christ. And it just stops. It, that's, where, that's where it leaves us. Paul in Rome proclaiming the gospel. And I think it's intentional because I think it's intentional that it stops without an ending, really. Because all that has taken place after Acts is the continuing movement of the gospel's advance in the world. Jesus said he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. 
and Acts is giving us this story. The church is spreading. The gospel is advancing. The spirit is empowering. The nations are converting to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. I wanted to go there now, but I'm gonna, it's, in, it's later in my notes. So Let's just go to Acts 13 right now. Acts 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus, where they arrived at Salamis. They proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all, unrighte of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the, Lord, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. This is the word of God. This is, this is a historical truth of what, what has happened in the early movements of Christianity and in the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. Let's look at what we see here and how it actually will transform us. The Word of God is not just for our, our knowledge. It's not just for our inspiration. It is to transform us into a people who think like the people of God, into a people who live like the people of God, into a people who, who feel and obey like the people of God. Verse 1 says, Now there were in the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers. You see, churches, the church is a global reality, but you can't do relationship, uh, strategize for mission with everyone, right? And so that's why we have local churches, because this is the specific church in Antioch, as opposed to the church at Corinth, or the church at, well, at this time, the church in Jerusalem. This is the church in Antioch. It's a specific local congregation of people who, who have probably even moved here because of persecution in their homeland, and yet they're taking the gospel to a new place, and they're owning the responsibility of being a present light in the place that they are. But they're also aware that more people need the gospel. And so not only are they thinking about their present community and sharing the gospel locally, they're thinking the world needs to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so they're strategizing for gospel witness. And they're, and they're doing so, and there's spiritual gifts at work here. Look at verse 1. It says there's prophets and teachers. You're going to meet prophets all throughout the book of Acts, and especially in this latter half. Prophecy is a spiritual gift that God has given to his church. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 20 says, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. But test everything and hold fast to what is good. I think it's important for us to recognize that prophecy in the New Testament is, is distinct from prophecy in the Old Testament. The prophets in the Old Testament had a thus says the Lord authority to their words when they were recorded in the scriptures. But in New Testament prophets, we even find New Testament prophets who don't get everything right. But they're still listening to the Spirit and speaking what the Spirit is calling them to say. 
It's not necessarily authoritative, but it is something that we're not to despise. It's something we're to listen to and to even heed when it seems to be true with what is good and right. It actually says in verse 2 that the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. What does that mean for the Holy Spirit to say? Right? I've never heard an audible voice. Now, it could be an audible voice. I'm not saying it can't be. But I personally think, and some people would disagree with me, but I personally think it's, the, it's a word that the Spirit gave through a prophet to the church as the prophets and teachers were at work there. Inspired by the Spirit, prophets speak with particular insight into a person's life and or future. And so we need to be open to this spiritual gift and discover it. For us Baptists, this is not easy. It's very difficult. Um, and and may, maybe you've come from backgrounds where you saw the gift of prophecy abused in some ways. And you saw it manipulate people and, and harm people. And, that, and that's very possible, but that doesn't take away the gift as a whole. I mean, I grew up in the North. Sweet tea is abused. <laughs> Do not order sweet tea when you go up to Michigan. You'll be sorely disappointed. But just because they use it wrongly doesn't mean it should never be used. Because there is a right way. And so, same with prophecy. We need to use it in the way that God intended it to be used as a spiritual gift for the church. There's also teachers, and they're faithfully explaining the scriptures and the stories of Jesus to God's people. Ahith Fernando says, if the church was to be both responsible and creative, it needed both teaching and prophecy. See, teaching keeps us tied to the word of God because this is exactly um, where we place our foundation. We don't need any more words from God. We have it all here. But prophecy is how God directs us in the particulars of our life. And sometimes, sometimes he, by his grace and mercy, gives us a word for our specific moment, for our specific church, or in this case, for this specific church in Antioch, to send out Paul and Barnabas. They didn't get that from reading the Old Testament scriptures. The Holy Spirit gave that to them in this moment. And because we found our life on the word of God, and it tells us to pursue prophecy, I think we should heed that. Prophets and teachers, there's a diversity of functions. And then notice else, there is actually a diversity of leadership. If you look at the list of names here, the prophets and the teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, which is Latin for dark-complexioned, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, you have in this list two Africans, two Jews, and a Roman. Like, this list is unheard of in this day. This list is something that only the gospel of Jesus Christ does, where it brings Jew and Gentile and people of all different types and ways together for the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the first missionary journey that we see strategized for, you have a unity of Africa and the Middle East and Rome and Europe working together for the sake of the gospel. It's ironic to me when I think back on my missionary stories as a kid that I always heard. I always heard of missions to Africa, you know, typically by Englishmen and Americans. I didn't hear much about the missions movement of Africa to the Middle East and Southern Europe, which is actually what Acts records for us. Did you guys know that Christianity is global? That we're not the center of the universe? Did you know that Jesus is the center and that he's about all nations and bringing all tribes and all languages to worship him? I mean, I, I just have to read for you some of these realities at play in the Atlas of Global Christianity today, Sunday. It is probable that more Chinese believers were in church than in all of so-called Christian Europe. This Sunday, more Anglicans attended church in each of Kenya, South Africa, Tanzania, and Uganda than did Anglicans in Britain and Episcopalians in the United States combined. Each one, each country in Africa has more Anglican Christians than the Anglicans and Episcopalians that are in all of the United States and Britain. 
More members of the Pentecostal Assemblies of God in Brazil were in church than the combined total of the two largest Pentecostal denominations in the United States. More people attended the Yoido, I'm probably not saying that right, full gospel church in Seoul, founded by Pastor David Yonggi Choi and his mother-in-law Choi Jashil, than attended all of the churches in significant North American denominations. Last Sunday, oh, this is cool, this Sunday, the churches with the largest attendance in England and France had mostly black congregations. And the largest congregation in all of Europe was the Embassy of the Blessed Kingdom of God for All Nations in Kiev, Ukraine, pastored by the Nigerian-born Sunday, Adelahaja. Hope I'm saying these names right, I'm probably not. But my point is, is that we, we get so locked into like, oh, this is what Christianity is like our expression of it. But here's the thing. The expressions of Christianity are many and vast. The gospel is what unites us all. This is a, this is a global movement that, of worshipers of Jesus Christ. And this is good news, and this is what starts here in the book of Acts. This first missionary journey is the beginning seeds of this kingdom that is going to expand and spread. And we have three continents represented in this first missionary send-off. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So here's the prerequisites for mission. If you look at verse 13, it says this. Uh, sorry, not verse 13. Chapter 13, verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So what, what are the prerequisites for mission? Because what you have here is the church gathering together as to set themselves up to be on mission for the kingdom of God. What are the prerequisites for mission? Well, first, you see that they are earnestly seeking the Lord. Right? A prerequisite for mission is they are earnestly seeking the Lord. They are praying, they are fasting, and they are worshiping and serving God. When we gather, it's not, it's not the end of all things is worship. Like everything is going to come to its final end in the worship of Jesus Christ. Mission won't be forever because when Jesus returns, he'll settle up everything and mission will be no more and all of eternity will be worship and service to God and living in his good presence. But right now, mission is the call of the church. And if we're going to be on mission, we first have to be in a relationship with God to where we are earnestly seeking his face and his will. Where we're crying out to him for him to guide us. And we need to pray as one Savior Church. We need to fast together and say, Lord, would you please move in us? Would we, we need to unite our hearts together in prayer to be on mission for the kingdom of God. We earnestly seek the Lord, and then they were listening to the Spirit, which means they had a readiness to obey. They were worshiping, fasting, praying, and seeking the Lord in that way, and they were ready. They were listening for the Spirit. They were, they were paying attention to prophetic words, and they were, they were listening to the teachers explaining the call of Jesus Christ to go and make disciples of all nations. And as they listened to the teachers and the prophets, and as the Holy Spirit moved in the church, they, they were ready to obey. Are we ready to obey? Are we really listening? Or are we afraid to listen because we're nervous of what he might actually call us to? Lastly, they were willing to sacrifice. Paul and Barnabas, those two dudes, they were, they were kind of significant to the church in Antioch. It was a big loss to send them out. They were probably doing ministry within that community in Antioch. And so for them to decide, you know what, we're going to set apart Saul and Barnabas, a couple of our, of our prophets and teachers who are significantly serving us, and we're going to send them out to go and take the gospel to other places, that was a sacrifice. I mean, could you imagine if, if we decided that a couple of our home group leaders, we were going to like take them away from your home group and we were going to send them out to another mission? How'd you feel? You'd feel like, wait a second, that's my home group leader. Take that home group leader. Right? 
don't take, don't take our home group leader. He's ministering to us. He's serving us. He's loving us. And sometimes we can be so honestly selfish with our groups and our community and our church as a whole that we forget the goal is to go out and to make disciples. The goal is to be a part of mission. So the prerequisites for, for the mission were earnestly seeking the Lord, a readiness to obey, and a willingness to sacrifice as the church lays hands on them and sends them off in the power of the Holy Spirit with the blessing of the church. This kind of mission is a bit of a challenge in today's world because we modern people, um, we tend to either focus on individualism or success. And let me explain what I mean. When we think about listening to the Spirit, like seeking the Lord, listening to the Spirit, and, and being willing to sacrifice, some of us in this room will think about our individual call. We'll think about how, okay, I need to honestly, I need to seek the Lord. I need to listen to the Spirit, and I need to go out and be willing to sacrifice things. But this is actually about the church doing this together. It's not an individualistic thing. They weren't listening to the Spirit with some like meditative state. Speak to me, O Spirit. They were with one another, listening to the Spirit together because the Holy Spirit works in concert with His church. It's an error to want the Spirit and avoid the church. See, individuals want the Spirit, and we want to seek the Lord, but we're on our own mission. There's no solidarity, there's no structure, and there's no being sent by a, by a church that's behind you and backing you and blessing you. Now, the error can also happen on the church side, because sometimes churches can get so caught up in success. And when I say churches, I'm talking about us, temptation for us. I'm not trying to bash other churches in the area. I'm saying for us, we need to remember that this is a temptation, that we can become so about our success that we stop listening to the Spirit. We can want to get together to worship and pray. We can even want to send people out, but it's, but it's really our own mission. There's really no sacrifice. We're not going to send out our best leaders. We're not, we're not going to fast together. Are you kidding, Ben? All of us not eat? That sounds terrible. We're not, we're not going to think creatively about how the Spirit's calling us to minister the gospel in our, in our community and in the world. We, we, we're comfortable how things are. The systems we got going on, the ways we got things going on, oh man, it's good. I came to this church because I thought it was comfortable. We don't want to be comfortable. We want the Spirit to be driving us into mission and conforming us into the image of Jesus. That process is not comfortable. It is not convenient. And so we don't want to be an individualist who just kind of does our own thing with God, but as a church we want to make sure that we're not just nestling into the comfort of the group but willing and ready to obey and even to sacrifice if necessary for the sake of the gospel. Ironically, the individual member who really just wants to hear from the Spirit, they don't understand how the Spirit operates because the Spirit operates in concert with the church. And ironically, the church that is, the, or the leaders of the church, I should say, even though they're a group of people, they, they're, they're, they can think success is, is determined by buildings and money in the budget and numbers in the room. But we want to be a church that listens to the Spirit. See, if we're a church that's not listening to the Spirit, then we don't understand the church. If we're just about the budget and the numbers, then we've missed what the church is all about. Paul and Barnabas, the church at Antioch, they seemed to have this readiness to obey and this willingness to sacrifice, and so they went. 
They get to their, uh, in Cyprus, they're in verse 4 and 5, and they go to the synagogues first. This was Paul's common practice. He would go to the, Jew, the Jews first, and then to the Greeks. He would go to the synagogues first. He was a Jewish man. He could go into the synagogues, and he could proclaim the gospel there. And usually there was a trickle effect. If, if, if a father of a household, if in that kind of cultural setting, would turn to faith in Jesus Christ, often the whole family would follow suit, even extended family. And so it was a significant strategy for Paul to take the gospel to the synagogues. And then we get into the story starting in verse 6, and there's three characters that collide here. There's Bar-Jesus, or Elimus, the magician. There's Sergius Paulus, who's the proconsul. And there's Paul, also called Saul. So what do we see here? Bar-Jesus. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Now, this might surprise you, but remember, uh, not all Jews are the same, right? We always th tend to think of, of people groups and countries, and we'll say, oh, you know, China is so... Do you know people there are in China? Like, you can't just describe China with the word China. Like, like and no, no one would say, like, you couldn't just say, oh, the people of One Saver Church are this. You'd be offended if I said that, because you'd be like, wait a second. I am not everyone else in this room. I would like to be referred to as an individual, please. And the point is that nothing's monolithic. Like, we don't just refer to groups in general, because maybe a majority thinks a certain way. We give, we give recognition to the individuality of every, of every person. And here, there were a lot of Jewish sects. In fact, I was in Israel when I was in college, and there's actually still a, a, a Jewish sect um, that believes, the because you know Jews typically, I'm, see, I'm summarizing right now, um, there's a typical understanding that the Messiah if they still believe a Messiah is coming, that he hasn't come yet. And so there's a Jewish sect that we witnessed when we were in Israel, and they actually believe, through some of their uh, Jewish writings, that the Messiah is going to be birthed by a male. And they don't know how it's going to happen, and they don't know when it's going to happen. Um, and so the men walk around with pay a special type of pant that actually has like a, a extra layer of cloth right here so that if the Messiah comes all of a sudden, it'll catch the child. I'm telling you, all of the men wear them. We watched them. We were looking out the window. We were just like, whoa, right? But, that, but they believe that's going to happen. And so that's kind of, they, they've made provisions for that kind of miracle. The point is, is that you can't just say, oh, Judaism is this. Nor can you say in the Bible, oh, well, the Jews were like this. There's a lot of diversity even within a, a community of, of, of Jews within the early first century. So here you have a Jew who's actually given into black magic. He's actually practicing. The, the word is magus in the Greek. It means he was a diviner who through various rituals claimed to be able to evoke the dead including the shades or spirits of one's ancestors, and coupled with the word prophet, says he's a false prophet, the text suggests that he claimed to be able to tell the future, perhaps through necromancy, perhaps through astrology, or magical spells and rituals involving both. He was involved in all of these things. He was a Jewish magician who was also a false prophet, and he, and the proconsul, Saulus, wait, what was his name? Sergius Paulus, he is a man of intelligence. And magicians were looked up to as people of intelligence. They knew a lot about, about the world and about the ways of the world. And so he was listening to, to this Bar-Jesus, son of Joshua, is how that's translated. Uh, he kind of reminds me, if you need a modern day connection, uh, remember Worm Tongue from the Lord of the Rings? Right? The, the, there's the king that's kind of overtaken by Saruman, and there's the worm tongue guy, and he's like giving bad counsel to the guy. Anyway, I don't know. Did I just like nerd out a little bit there? I'm sorry. Um, worm tongue is like Bar Jesus. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Can I get a nod from somebody? Okay, thank you. Whew, okay. I was getting nervous there. Um, so he, he's giving this bad information to the proconsul, and actually, he's trying to keep him from hearing the gospel. It says in verse 7 that when the proconsul summoned Barnabas and Saul, he sought to hear the word of God, but Elimus opposed them. See, he wants to hear the word of God, but Bar-Jesus knows, or Elimus, the magician, he knows, no, I don't think I want you hearing these words. And so he's trying to sow thoughts of, 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 of discontinuity, and he's opposing the gospel word. And so what does Paul do? 
when he's being actively opposed in his message of the gospel by someone who is using deceptiveness and trickery against the gospel message, what does Paul do? My bad. I don't want to make any waves. I realize that might be your truth. This is my truth. Can't we all just get along? Can't we just kind of deal with this kind of thing in a nice, calm manner? That's actually not what Paul does. He goes all out profit on this guy. He says, you son, okay, remember his name's Bar-Jesus, which means son of Joshua. It's a little play on words here. You son of the devil. You enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? That's intense. So now we all have our commission. You need to go out there to all your family members and say, you son of the devil. <laughs> I hope you know I'm joking. Um, sometimes we can take scripture and apply it wrongly. Um, many people will take texts like this and say, see, we're supposed to go and bash other people who oppose the gospel. There's a really important piece here. Paul was filled with the Spirit. That's one. He was filled with the Spirit. He had the spiritual gift of prophecy. That's two. And he's doing this because this man who is into black magic and necromancy and really kind of demonic stuff is trying to keep this guy from hearing the gospel truth. It's a very specific moment where Paul has to call out the work of the enemy that this guy is being a messenger of. And he actually inflicts blindness on him. If you look at verse 11, it says, And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see for a time. Do you know who also got this same kind of thing happen to him? Paul. See, Paul was opposed to the gospel. Jesus struck him with blindness for a time, and then he was looking for someone to lead him, the text says. So he actually gives Elimus, the magician, the same kind of challenge for opposing the gospel, the same, I mean, punishment, if you will, and, and Elimus is hit with blindness, and then he's looking for someone to lead him by the hand. But notice the mercy of God, even for Elimus. It says, for a time. See, this was a sign that was going to not only reveal to Sergius Paulus that this is the truth, that the gospel word is real and it's confirmed by signs and miracles, but it's also a grace to Elimus. He could have struck him blind for life. And he gives him blindness for a time to make a point that your ways of deception and trickery cannot stand against the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul give strong words against the deception and trickery. Elimus is struck blind. And it says after that, the proconsul believed or began to believe when he saw what had occurred. For he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. It wasn't the miracle that astonished him. What astonished him was the teaching of the Lord. The gospel truth captured his heart and he began to believe. We don't know what, what, what came of him. We have no historical account of whether he truly did convert or not, but he began to believe that this was something, this gospel truth must be real. Very often in the Acts, and we're going to see this more and we'll talk about it more, but the signs and miracles done by the apostles kind of solidify the validity of the gospel message in people's hearts. Okay, so this is a really cool story. But what does it have to do with us, right? Why, 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 does, why does Luke give us this story? I think he gives us this story for a lot of reasons. But there's some that I really want to bring into play here. This is the first time that the church has strategized for mission in obedience to the Holy Spirit to take the gospel to all nations. And they come across different characters, and we're going to see they come across persecution, they come across resistance, and they have to respond in any given moment as to what the Spirit leads them to do in those different places. 
But this is so much more than just a story. This is a testimony to what can happen when Christ's church worships, prays, and fasts in order to hear from the Spirit how we might be sent out on mission in Jesus' name. Let me, let me say that one more time because it's a long sentence. This is a testimony to what can happen when Christ's church worships, prays, and fasts in order to hear from the Spirit how we might be sent out on mission in Jesus' name. The early church here is giving us an example, a witness to what happens when you, when you listen to the Spirit and you obey the Spirit and you go out in the power of the Spirit with the truth of the gospel. And by the way, I've been saying this word gospel. Maybe I haven't explained it well. I was kind of hoping our, um, our table uh, communion and the songs we sing would have been a good explanation of the gospel. But the gospel is the fact that we are broken in our sin. God is holy in his essence and we cannot be in relationship with him unless our sin is dealt with. And Jesus Christ has come to rescue us from sin, to redeem us from death and the devil, and to say, you can now be in relationship with me because I have covered you with the blood of Jesus Christ, and now I'm welcoming you into my kingdom where Jesus reigns and where he is going to establish it for all of eternity. Like this gospel message is not just about, hey, your life can be a little better tomorrow if you just give in to Jesus. This is about the story of the world where Jesus is going to reign for all eternity. It's good news because it's for the world to hear that Jesus is the Savior of the world and the King of the world. He's dealt with the problem of sin. And we see here that we've got to strategize to take this message abroad or even to our neighbors across the street. So here's my question for us this morning. What are our stories of mission? Like, this is a story of mission. What are our stories of mission? Will we have any this year? Are we going to have stories of mission this year? January 2020, right? We're beginning a new year. When we come to 2021, will we have stories of how we were seeking the Lord, responding to Him in obedience, and watching as we went out with the gospel truth and people were brought to faith in Jesus Christ? Will those be our stories at the end of the year? Are we seeking the Lord so that we can be a part of those stories? It is possible that we won't see missional fruit because the Lord is choosing not to give it. The Spirit blows where He wills and ultimately He is in charge of conversion and gospel advancement. But I also think it's possible that we are not seeing a movement of the gospel in our communities and neighborhoods because we are not even applying the prerequisites. We're not seeking the Lord. We're not ready to obey, and we're not willing to sacrifice whatever he calls us to, to take the gospel message out. We need to be earnestly and corporately seeking the Lord and listening to the Spirit. We need to be ready to obey. We need to be willing to sacrifice comfort and convenience to go where the Lord would send us. Just as I struggle and wrestle with this reality in my own heart, I think about the time when I was in Honduras. And it was so easy for me to go up to a house and share the gospel. And then I think about when I did some evangelism in Savannah recently. And it was a little harder, but still kind of easy. And then I think about going to my neighbor across the street or actually, I think about yesterday when I was driving past and there were some disc golfers out here and I felt like I should go talk to them about Jesus and I didn't. Why is it always harder for us to share the gospel when we get closer to home? Because there's greater risk involved. You know, right? You have, you have to live close to your neighbors. You have, you, have to, you have to work with your coworkers. You have to see your family. <laughs> It's a, little, it's a little more risky even just to take the gospel to those closest to us. Some of us are perfectly willing to do what we need to do for the world, but we can't even share the gospel truth with the neighbor we invite over for dinner that evening. 
My point is not to shame you or to make you feel bad about yourselves. My point of this is to call you to mission. We don't have to be shamed or feel like we're not enough because we've already discussed this. Jesus is our everything. Jesus is our righteousness. Your evangelism, your mission is not your righteousness. In fact, it's a temptation for many Christians to find their righteousness and all the things they do for Jesus. We don't find our righteousness in this, but Jesus has called us to this because this is the good news message. Are we going to be ready and willing to take the gospel to the world? Where does it start for us, church? Where does it start? It starts with worship and prayer and fasting. We can't do it on our own. I want you to think about in your life right now, whether it be family, neighbors, friends, co-workers, think about at least three or five names of people that do not know the beauty and majesty of Jesus Christ. Think about their names. Are you praying for them? Are you praying for God to give you opportunities to share the gospel with them? Are you pouring out your heart and fasting for their conversion so that they can know that Jesus is so good and he covers our sin and he offers new life and his ways are always wise and they're always better and he works in us love. Are, are you ready to take that message to them? We've got to be a church. We, I want us to be a church so badly that is seeking the Lord and ready to obey in whatever he calls us to. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I'm going to ask Will to come up and just play on the piano for a little bit. And I really want to make, I, want, I really want to ask you to pray personally right now. But that's too comfortable. And I just don't think we can be a comfortable church. So uh, actually, I'm changing my mind. <laughs> I need you to stand if you don't mind. Now I realize some of you might be here and you're not used to praying out loud. But I want you to turn into small groups of five people maybe. Try not to make sure no one's excluded. You can, if you as a family you can gather. If you're uncomfortable praying, you do not have to pray this morning. Um, but I want you to lift up the names that God brought to your mind with one another, with the church, corporately. We're, if we're a church, then we're praying. If we can't pray, then we are a joke of a church. So let us pray together. And let us pray for those who do not know the goodness and the glory of Jesus Christ. The church is known by its prayer. And so let's be a church that's on mission. And first, that means we've got to seek the Lord together, not in an individualistic, comfortable way, but together. So can we just circle up and whoever's comfortable, just start praying out loud and pray for the names of the people in your life that you want to see come to know Jesus Christ, co-workers, family members, preferably nobody here. Um, <laughs> you know, that could get a little awkward. But if you can just pray with one another for the people in your life and, and join with a group who you're not used to being around even, look around and let's pray together. Lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let's pray for those in our life that need to know the glory and beauty of Jesus Christ. Thank you.